it's really nice to, to have you all with us. My name is Diana Damian Martin. I am a Roma Romanian white woman in my 30s. I have short black hair and I'm wearing a white summery top and I have a blurred background behind me. I'm a researcher, educator and artist working with migrants and culture and based at Central School of Speech and Drama. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to how do we ethically collect data? So this is a panel that brings artists, cultural workers and researchers together to offer reflections and provocations around collaboration and research for change in culture, thinking beyond reform, to focus on building nurturing equitable research processes. This event is part of Freelance Futures, which is a summer program of learning and action for equitable conditions and culture. And this event is being recorded for future access. So before we start, uh, I'm going to outline some access and other information. My clear text is providing our captioning today. So to access this, please click the CC closed caption button. There's going to be a link with the chat, which means you can have it open in another browser. Interpreters of Color Network are also providing our BSL interpretation today and uh, their image is going to be pinned, so you'll be able to view Rachel at all times. Freelance Futures is a call for collective learning and action to build equitable conditions for freelancers working in culture. It will take all our efforts to affect real change, and so we welcome all your insights and experiences as independent practitioners and practitioners working within cultural organizations, unions, funding body, and policy making. And given that we need all of us, this is our basic code of conduct for today. Please respect and value your collaborators in this room. Be aware of your privilege, know when to make space and when to take space. Avoid overcomplicated language and explain technical terms. We are all at different stages of learning, respect the person and challenge the idea. This is a relaxed environment, so feel free to access this event in any way that makes participating work for you. If possible, please start with your video option, just so we can welcome everyone into the space. The session today will mostly be a sharing and offering from our speakers, but we welcome your questions and input throughout. And if there's time, we'll hopefully be able to get to your questions at the end. Uh, so to do so, um, type the word question in the chat function and we will come to you. Uh, and towards the end, if there's time, you'll also be able to, to raise the hand function in the reaction tool. And following the event, we are holding another session on the 5th of July, which is a space to consider what we've heard and further connect with the provocations offered today. And that won't be a public session, but we will be sharing information that emerges out of that session. So if there's something you'd like uh, the speakers to follow up on or think about, please do share that. And we also really invite you to use Mighty Networks and other spaces to continue the conversation. So with us today, um, we have uh, Professor Dave O'Brien from the University of she Sheffield, um, research practitioner, Dr. Ella Perry Davis, uh, Dr. Jesse Parrott, Data and Research Manager at INCARTS, brilliant social worker and racial justice activist, Anik Metefia, and joining us via a recorded provocation will be interdisciplinary educator and researcher, Dr. Rua Ali. And we're also joined by Rachel Jones, our BSL interpreter, Kim Daly, our captioner, Melanie Rashbrook, who's our digital producer in hiding, and the brilliant Nasha Daly, who is uh, our freelance futures producing queen and artist extraordinaire. And of course, all of you. And we welcome you and we're very glad you're joining us today. So I'm not going to be doing all of the talking. Um, I am just going to do a really brief context. And then I'm going to be inviting the speakers to introduce themselves as they present. Uh, and we will take it from there. So over the past few years, as a result of grassroots organizing and advocacy and also research cultures, we've seen an increasing deployment of data-led or testimony-led evidentiary research processes 
for cultural sector reform. And at the same time, we have seen the ways in which the institutionalization of diversity has led to a management or a governance of difference, often at the expense of accountability. The gathering today in part emerges from some of our own experiences undertaking research with migrants and culture and the drive to center migrant led research methods and processes. The challenges are multiple data around migrancy is scarce, but it is also because data gathering and harvesting results in deep insecurity for many for furthering precarity all the way to deportation. And there is a wealth of experience and expertise across the diverse migrant communities that make up the cultural sector and beyond that needs to be centered rather than instrumentalized. So we want to think and work cooperatively to account for the many intersections that shape migrancy and change. But this gathering considers not only how we model different research processes and practices within our communities and beyond policy level advocacy, but also how we can work together to create nurturing, safe and activating ecologies of knowledge and research in an often under-resourced, hostile, and even overwhelming sector. And similarly, we want to think about how we meet the challenges of disparate pieces of research that don't always speak to each other and tend to what our research speaks to, how it is used or misused, and what a cooperative research ecology that activates change could be, aware of the limits of reform and informed by the lessons of abolitionist work. So we invited the brilliant speakers today to offer provocations that seek to address how we collaborate, use and activate research for change in the cultural ecologies we're embedded in. And we're also here to think carefully about the desire for data as a mode of evidencing structural oppression or marginalization. What are the pitfalls of evidentiary research and what are the models might we center? How can we shift resources and create research that speaks to intersecting ecologies? How can we dialogue with policy influences our makers and also make our community policy makers? How can we draw on research methods and processes that are enabling, agential and cooperative of and for the communities they concern? And how do we account for the many pressures at all levels that are impacting on all our ability and safety of doing this work. So we are going to firstly hear from Rua, then Anik, Jesse, Ella, and Dave, and hopefully all of you. So um, I'm gonna ask Melanie to um, play Rua's video whenever they're ready. Thank you. Hi. My name is Dr. Rawa Ali, and I am an ethnically diverse researcher working at Central University of London. My pronoun is she, her, and I am in my late 30s and have long brown hair. Um, I will attempt to share my screen uh, so I can um, share my PowerPoints. Here we go. Um, and start by introducing myself. Um, I am an interdisciplinary educator and researcher working on race and diversity, um, inequalities and institutional change within the creative and cultural industry. And today I'm going to reflect on two areas. Um, firstly, about being marginalized both as a researcher and because of the research focus and how to address that. And secondly, I would like to reflect on the ethics of research when researching issues of race, working with communities and institutions. My goal in talking about both is to think aloud with you um, on how we carve a space really for ourselves and create networks of solidarity and how we conduct uh, collaborative research with underrepresented communities ethically and in a way that affect change. 
in the institutions and workplaces that we work with and occupy. So I started my, uh, um, my research journey as a PhD student, uh, looking at Arab American cultural production post 9-11. I was exploring um, what it means to be an identity in crisis and what cultural products the artists produce. Um, and also importantly, how, how do these artists negotiate marginality and access within a renewed discourse of um, exonophobia, uh, neo-orientalism and neoliberalism. So far, so good. What I found, though, uh, when I started my PhD research as an international student who come from an underrepresented group, is that my experience in the UK HE sector was that of marginalisation. My research, not being on the white canon, was frankly not taken seriously. I was um, a number within the international students accumulative and capitalist system. Um, and it took me a while to understand and to find the vocabulary to even describe my marginality. And it was until I think the second year that I knew I had to look outside my home department, my university. I had to look for networks of support, guidance and solidarity. So the solution to addressing my situation was building a collective outside of the UK. I managed to do that through connecting with brilliant grassroots organizations, um, both in the States and in the Arab world um, and through conferences. But of course, that requires access, that requires resources and visa. I was in a position that enabled me that access and that led to a wonderful network of support from minoritized scholars. Um, and we've done some good work together. So for example, we're just finalizing a volume on Arab theater and politics, but we need to think of ways to overcome the barriers to these networks. You know, things like migrants in culture, for example, can be a brilliant base for this work. We need, I think, to advocate for digital access to academic conferences hosted in the global north, because visas are a big barriers. And I have witnessed many brilliant scholars who are uh, from the global south denied entry into these spaces and simply disregarded from the academic community. I'm working on those issues through my networks and the little influence I have, um, but it's a, it's a much bigger issue. Um, and I would just like to say here that if my experience is familiar to anyone and they feel they need support, then please reach out. Um, similarly, I offer my support to any activist networks working to address these issues. Now, I've moved, um, focus in my research to explicit engagement with race and diversity within the cultural sector um, and cultural production in the UK. And I would like to take this opportunity um, to, to talk about some of the things that worked really well and some of the mistakes that we should avoid when working with ethnically diverse and underrepresented communities. But before delving in, I want to acknowledge the challenges that this research presents. Firstly, there is a lot of reluctance from organizations and partners to collaborate with you when you are asking those questions, because sometimes they just don't want to hear the answers that you are going to provide. And secondly, there will be reluctance and hesitancy from within the community because quite frankly, they're fed up. I've heard it so many times that similar research has been done. Findings of racism or what doesn't work have been reported, but nothing has been done in actuality. So the question from the community is, 
and I hear this over and over again. Why should I do this again? And my answer has always been that to be honest and, and transparent. So I say we are doing this together. We will try to make noise and we will try to get our voice heard as much as we can and use our connections. And that change can only happen when we persist, really. And so from this, I want to talk a little bit about the ethics of, of, of the research practice um, and, and how I do this in my research. And, you know, as, a, as and this is as a space to learn and, and, and kind of think together. Um, in 2018, I started working on race um, in the cultural industries with the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity at the University of Manchester. I was fortunate to have like-minded colleagues who were new scholars of race. And for the first time, I felt I belonged. I, I finally found common language and vocabularies to be able to pursue academic and activist work. I embarked on a, a collaborative uh, research project that explored how cultural institutions can reproduce or mitigate ethnic inequality. Our main methodology was institutional ethnography, and that is to go to the institution, observe, um, be there in the daily practices and activities of the institution, have interviews, um, and collect documents and analyze them, um, anything that has to do with the daily lives of the institution. Now, if we're talking about the ethics of research, particularly when researching issues of inequalities or working with racialized and underrepresented groups, I think there are a few things that we need to ask ourselves and reflect on. And the first is why, why do the research? There are obviously many reasons, but I think at the heart of it, the answer should be to try to make a change. Because this then will guide the research process and how we interact both with our collaborators from the communities, the institution we're working with or in, and the organizations that we partner with. And this takes me to how or to the how and trying to formulate um, equitable equitable research practices i think when involved in research of this kind transparency and doing the research ethically should be central i mean it should be central in any research that we conduct but it, particularly when we are approaching these subjects and by this I mean communicating clearly and honestly the aims of the research and what is expected of the participants and partners and partners and why they should go on this journey with us. Importantly, I think we should center care in the process. We might ask sensitive and uncomfortable questions, and these should be thought of really carefully. Um, and always thinking of how our research collaborators and participants might feel and be ready and, and for us to be ready to pause, to, to stop and to check in. One um, good practice that might be able, uh, um, that we may, might be able to do as well is to research organizations and charities that offer support in the areas that we are investigating and distribute this list uh, and these contacts to our research collaborators and participants if they need the extra support. One more thought is to use um, the academic institutions resources that are available to us and whether that is small pots of money or equipment or workspaces and try to make those resources available to the communities and collaborators we are working with. And I um, 
I quote here uh, Remy Joseph Salisbury and Laura Conley, who called this method uh, reparative theft in their anti-racist color activism book. Um, and one more thing to consider is um, how, how we conceive um, our research collaborators and participants, really. I've always been uncomfortable with the term research participants um, and the concept of harvesting and extracting data. Um, this is particularly true when engaging in research with underrepresented and minoritized groups. And ways to get around this could be seeing if you could offer some kind of remuneration uh, to the research collaborators, um, using the institution's resources to benefit them, as I mentioned earlier, and possibly even offering co-authorship in outputs. But what is important to consider as well is that affecting change can happen while we are doing the research. It's not simply the outcome or the output of the research which could steer the change we would like to see. As a researcher, your presence or collaboration with an institution or a group can itself make that change, affect that change uh, within the setting of your research. As an example, um, when we were researching the, how institutions reproduce and or mitigate um, ethnic inequality, one of our case studies was Manchester Museum, where we conducted extensive um, institutional ethnography. And while being in the institution, we were able to advise on their uh, EDI uh, policy recommending action and target points uh, with accountability measures for these actions and we were also able to influence a change in the recruitment process and this obviously this was due to the conversations and the interviews we were having but also being an active and um, a vigilant researcher so, and, and offering advice when possible and when useful and in that, I follow sociologist Dorothy Smith, who argues that the researcher is not outside, but always implicated within the context of the research. And she argues that the, the skills we have as researchers should be useful and relevant to the people and fields of investigation. And here it's, it's, it's important to also uh, note on the position, positionality of the researcher. Um, I mean the ethnicity, the gender, and so forth of the researcher, and the power dynamics between the researcher and the researched. In the interest of time, I will stop here, um, but I hope these reflections are useful and can be applicable to research and work outside of academia. Ultimately, I think, we empower ourselves and hopefully others by ensuring that our research processes and practices are ethical and equitable. And I'm happy to answer any questions by email. Um, I can be reached um, uh, by email at roaa.ali at cssd.ac.uk or Twitter. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And hopefully we will have some space to, uh, to, to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you. Ra. Uh, can I uh, invite Annick? Hello, um, I'm Annick. I hope that my Wi-Fi will be okay throughout this talk. Um, I hope that the technical team can jump in the chat um, if that's not the case. So I'm not talking like a robot for a while before I realize. 
Um, so my name is Annick. I'm French, but I've lived in the UK for five years. Um, I'm 30 years old. I'm a light-skinned, black and mixed cis woman um, with long curly hair currently sitting in um, a white room. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself and my practice a little bit, and then I'm going to talk about um, the Voices at Shake project and the research that I led and co-produced last year, and that we are currently in a dissemination phase for. Um, so I am a social worker, a youth worker. I work mostly, or I have worked for the past um, 10 years almost with young black and brown people who are experiencing different forms of state violence, whether it's police harassment, um, oppression to do with uh, housing, um, uh, things that have to do with access to food, access to health, the migrant status of the people in their families or them, for themselves, etc., cetera, um, and who want to challenge institutional power. So I've helped design, run uh, campaigns by and with young people. Um, and I've also worked with refugees as a caseworker. And I've recently started doing research on social work and youth work. And the question of data is something I feel very strongly about because my own practice of social work and youth work, I like to define it as political. Um, I like to say that um, for me, basically, um, I need to practice a form of youth work that acknowledges the context of white supremacy and systemic oppressions that it exists in. Um, I need to practice youth work that um, is aware of its own colonial classist and racist history. Um, there is um, such a big history of that in social and youth intervention. Um, acknowledging also the current hostile context of austerity, the policing of black and brown people and the funding cuts to their community spaces where I work. So my practice tries to center the experience of black and brown young people to prioritize their agency and well-being in this oppressive context. And I try to hold youth charities accountable for the power imbalances and the colonial structures that they still operate from, from a reparations perspective. Um, so I led a research project um, in 2020 that was part of the Voices That Shake project. So for people who are not familiar with Voices That Shake, it is a youth organization that was uh, created in 2010 is hosted by the environmental justice NGO platform, but it is independent in the sense of like, it is its own project that is entirely led by uh, people of color and young people. Um, it is a project that supports young people of the global majority um, who are based in the UK to explore arts, media, and to challenge power um, and harmful narratives um, about their own communities. And we center community and individual healing, and we try to um, connect um, the local uh, struggles that the young people experience, uh, like some of the ones that I've named around policing, housing, food justice, etc., with global um, struggles that um, they experience as well, but that their families and communities experience in other parts of the globe. It is a radical project that um, where people, like young people get to write and film and, and, and sing and use all these types of media um, and explore their own practice as artists to express these things, but also to build real sustainable um, change through, through their practice and their connection to community organizing in their very local environments. Um, I would say that for me, the question of data collection shows up um, daily as a social worker. Um, data collection is, I would say nowadays, nowadays a given 
in uh, social work and especially in reporting to funders. And you have very little control um, or, or knowledge really of where this data ends up. Um, what I feel very strongly about is that this kind of proliferation of, or this, this acceptance that um, um, the language around data and data collection in the fundraising sector, and particularly in the charity sector, it does come from the influence, in my opinion, of the kind of start, startup world and the capitalistic world, the world of social businesses, for example, um, that have a very strong influence on the fundraising world and, and on society as a, as a whole. Um, just in my time of doing social work in the last nine years, I've really noticed this increasing normalization of the use of certain words like impact. Impact wasn't a word that was that present uh, back when I started doing social work when I was 21, and now it's a completely accepted thing. Um, for me, it's because of the, the power and influence of these kind of startup and social businesses that are using codes from the, from the commercial, from the capitalist world, the business world, really, and who build these big, shiny, very attractive um, social, in quotes, I insist on that, um, social um, projects that really for a lot of different reasons tend to contribute to very harmful things um, in our society such as the devaluation devalu of social work, the devalu devaluation of social work done by people of colour, working class people of colour mostly as they tend to usually be in the lower paid jobs and frontline jobs when it comes to the kind of pyramid of social work. Um, and it maintains this kind of system where you have CEOs and trustees of socially driven, in quotes, once again, businesses that tend to be middle class, white, Oxbridge educated, um, who are very critical of the, the ways of the traditional, more traditional ways of doing social work by often working class people of color. Um, and this kind of focus on innovation um, led once again by white men, uh, usually middle class white men, with the whole language that it, it comes with, and a completely uh, a complete invisibilization of the everyday work of often women uh, of color, maintaining the 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 structures and the 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 community spaces and th things like that for people of their own community. I think generally as a society we tend to be kind of mesmerized by the promise of innovation and that includes the, the world of, of social social work and pro progress and things like that and we ignore the fact that the real um, core of social work is maintaining things and fighting for things to to stay uh, such as your local uh, your local uh, youth club or things like that, that are, are being shut down um, more and more so What's interesting for me with the question of data is that with these spaces gaining power and influence, um, I, I also uh, notice that it's spaces that are led by people for whom data has never been predatory or harmful in their own lives. Um, it's not people for whom data rhymes with surveillance, with danger, um, with, you know, everything that has to do with immigration, the home office, etc. So they come from a place of privilege where data is knowledge and that's it because data is never used against them. And anyone who's from a working class background, from a marginalized community, whether it's uh, black communities, brown communities, um, dis the disabled communities, um, things like that, people with different mental health uh, illnesses and, and things like that know how data can be used against them and taking agency and power away from them, whether it's in the doctor's office, whether it's at hospital, whether it's with the social worker there or, or you know, with your benefits and things like that. Data works against you most of the time. So that's something that I really try to keep in mind in my own social work, but I have found myself cornered at times um, as a youth worker, as a, a social worker, like collecting and, and giving over data is a condition to getting funding. And so to your own program where you're trying to center well-being and, and, and healing and things like that, um, 
for it to happen, you have to, you know, um, give over data to a funder that sometimes is going to go and give it to an agency that's going to go and give it to an institution and you have no idea what's the chain of, of, um, of where the data ends up basically and we've seen it with programs such as prevent for example i have had to teach myself completely uh like by myself and and using resources in my communities as well of fellow black and brown people especially muslim people as well looking out for each other's well-being of reading between the lines of a funding application and knowing like how to recognize when the data i was collecting was going to end up um, at the home office and it's usually programs with a lot of different names um, like uh, I, ha I like to joke with my colleagues that usually when you see um, the word together and togetherness it's it's a bit scary because usually it has something to do with prevent keeping people together or building togetherness or Britain together or things like that so it's just this kind of informal knowledge and, and skill set that you have as a social worker if you care about these things and you look out for your people and you it's an everyday kind of dance of negotiating the agency and the power of the people you work for in opposition to unfortunately a lot of harmful practices in, in the fundraising sector I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about this idea of data-driven reform. Um, I'm, I'm quite like harsh on this idea myself. I do feel like it's this kind of carrot that's being dangled in front of socially conscious um, researchers. It's that this kind of mirage that you're constantly chasing after of like a, a data-driven reform is possible the promise of policy change based on gathering, collecting data. I myself do not believe that what we lack is data currently. I don't really buy into the idea that more data will inevitably create policy change. I think um, that saying we don't have enough data is a bit of the lazy approach for the state the institutions to to rely on that and just push people to constantly chase that thing and 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 get people stuck in the cycle of constantly collecting data over and over usually in the same ways in the same harmful ways and uninventive ways um and the reform that's promised never comes so when people tell me we don't have enough data i say we we have enough true we have mostly biased data we have very disempowering data and we need more data that that is um, designed and led and offered uh, uh, and thought through by the people that it's about. Um, and I'm just going to say a word about how we did it in Shake before, before wrapping up. Um, but I just really feel like it gets people stuck in the illusion um, that data will so solve everything. And also the illusion of the, the power that storytelling can have. So it's kind of constantly putting the marginalized communities in this um, position of telling their own stories over and over and we know how harmful and limiting it is uh, because it's being used by institutions that seek to limit and, and harm these communities. Constantly placing for example refugee communities that I've worked with in the position of telling your story over and over again generally like entire groups of people that have to justify their every decision by their life story with no no right to, to um, to secrecy, no right to privacy. Um, and I really want to question that idea of collecting trauma data and, and the interest of the institutions that are the, the ones often inflicting the trauma. Why are they so interested in collecting data about the trauma that they're inflicting? So is this kind of like, um, is this contradiction that I'm, I'm interested in? So I will just end on saying a little bit about Shake. So in the Shake um, research project, um, we from the start decided to not collect quantitative data. We focused on qualitative data in exploring um, the impact and questioning that, that, that word, the impact that Shake, its intensive courses for, for young people and young adults, had had in the last 10 years, what sort of community organizing activism, what sort of art work had come out um, of the 10 years of existence of Sheikh, what sort of real change had been 
um, had been uh, done by the work of these these young people, taking what they learned in Sheikh to other places, creating their own, I don't know, media production company, their own community organizing project, their own choir, their own um, their own garden, like community garden and, and all these, these amazing spaces. Um, so in the Sheikh report that you can download for free on our website, in our methods and framework um, part, you can see examples of graphs where you're invited to cut them up um, on a dotted line with a picture of scissors um, because you're invited to really question that idea of how, how reporting on youth initiatives, youth projects usually is all about how employable are the young people at the end of your program? What sort of contribution to society are they going to make? How many are in employment? How many is a positive exit? And a positive exit can mean anything from they have a two week, zero hour contract somewhere to they are in full employment. Um, so we invited people to actually cut up physically these, these graphs and, and, and tear apart these, um, these pre-notions pre that you go into when you work with young people. Um, we relied on the work of many, many black and brown activists, community organizers, social workers, researchers from all around the world, from reports such as the Why Am I Always Being Researched um, report that I'm sure will be, will be linked in your resources um, as a very good example of questioning that. Um, and we were all also really resting on our very solid um, shake values. So the shake values are um, decolonial um, and centering the, the idea of marginalized people producing um, their own knowledge about themselves. Um, the, the, the value of creativity, the value of being anti-oppression in everything that we do, and an interesting one also is prefigurative. Um, by that, we mean that we work towards personal, collective and structural change and liberation. And being prefigurative in that means that we build structures and ways of working with others who are already enacting the kind of world we want to see in the now. So the space, space for Shake is a space where the world is as it should be, as we think we should be. We, it's like we're rehearsing the, the revolution. So I'm just gonna finish on, on saying that Shake is an example that a truly youth-led project exists. It's not this thing that so many charities chase and can never really do of like, how do you do youth-led uh, projects? How do you transfer power? That's the big questions at the moment in the charity sector. It already exists. It's just being invisibilized and not supported um, correctly. Um, but it's a youth led project. It's a black and brown led project. It is a radical political project, which also makes it a bit hard to, to thrive in, in this fundraising world where the political is this big scarecrow um, idea. Um, but um, I really, I'm going to do shameless promo at this point, but I really encourage you to, to check out our publications because they say everything about our ethos and how different shake is and what sort of future it promises for for black and brown young people organizing their own spaces with our guidebook and producing their own art about themselves with our anthology and producing research for us by us with our research well, thank you thank you anik uh, i think someone just a reminder to please if you're not speaking, be on mute. I think someone is traveling with us, maybe somewhere. Um, can I invite Jesse? Hello, thank you. I'm um, also having slight issues with internet. So if um, it drops out, hopefully um, it won't last too long. But um, I'm Jesse Parrott. I'm the data and research manager at Ingards UK, as well as a freelance performer, playwright and academic. I'll start with a brief description of myself. I'm a white non-binary person in my early thirties with short brown hair and brown eyes. I'm sitting in front of a white screen in my powered wheelchair and wearing a long sleeve turquoise top, but not much of that is in the frame. Since my posture is affected by a scoliosis. 
as well as being an accessibility tool, this description illustrates the multiple intersections of my self situation as a queer, trans and disabled person and highlights how my personal and professional perspectives combine when creating and conducting research. As a member of marginalised groups, I'm often part of a target demographic or several myself, which means I'm frequently the researched rather than the researcher, most often as what is termed a service user or a participant, and occasionally an ex expert by experience. These are all phrases I have an incredibly ambivalent relationship with, and I use them advisedly as a result. But I also use them here for a reason, because although I am presenting this provocation on behalf of Ink Arts UK, and it therefore draws principally on learnings gained throughout projects designed in my role there, it feels vital to acknowledge that my approach to and engagement with the collection and analysis of data must necessarily be inflected by my lived experiences. It is also crucial to observe the privileges that underpin aspects of my perspective, particularly racial and academic, since I'm a white person with a doctorate, and that these also intersect with my marginalization, not least because one of my impetuses for pursuing PhD study came from suggestions that both my academic and creative work might be taken more seriously with such a qualification to bolster them, given my aforementioned lived experiences of impairment and gender and sexual diversity. Moving on to the substance of this provocation, it aims to offer a perspective on the ethics of data collection through the prism of several points made by multiple participants across Inc. Arts research projects. I should therefore note here that the phrase lived experiences is another I use advisedly, but it is relevant to this discussion because it is one which is raised repeatedly by respondents to our research, which, after Kimberley Crenshaw, takes an intersectional approach in order to support the organization's primary focus of anti-racist training, consultancy and advocacy. Respondents reference their lived experiences in a variety of contexts when discussing a desire for and the importance of authenticity, but also when expressing the pressure and expectations they feel to be representatives of their identities and communities. I would posit that this dual context places it at the heart of conversations around ethical data collection, especially in relation to the work of Inc. Arts and other organisations engaging with and advocating for people from marginalised groups through research. This is because, using both quantitative and qualitative means, we are asking them to share their experiences, which can often be incredibly painful or traumatic in order to create an evidence base from where we can promote and propel meaningful change. There is consequently an ethical requirement to take proper care of the contributions they give us and do them justice within reports or other outputs, but also an ethical imperative to use those contributions as an impetus and even a catalyst for change that is not merely meaningful, but measurable. tech issues, apologies, there we go. This, of course, raises the question of what constitutes this kind of change, and indeed this kind of data. Meaningful and measurable by whose metrics? By the sample size, or by the significance of the stories, struggles and successes shared? Tailored to whose agenda? Within the context of the current and historical social structures and hierarchies, which are arguably responsible for the inequities of experience in the first place. It also highlights 
an additional issue which is often an instrumental influence on individuals willingness or otherwise to engage with this sort of research consultation fatigue for people who are having to prove the validity of their experiences or even existence on a near constant basis the idea of having to do so again is often too exhausting to consider this is particularly true when called to contribute for the purposes of an inquiry or inquiries plural that may not necessarily be guaranteed to make a material difference to their lives whether professionally or personally this can the conundrum this creates is that at least according to the current and historical social structures and hierarchies referenced above exactly this sort of proof i.e data is what is necessary to inform and inspire the material shift in circumstances and cultures the need to navigate this apparent dichotomy is further complicated by another point often made by participants in our project there is a sense that as with other kinds of gatekeepers in the case of ink arts cohort usually commissioners or similar executives frequently the people who clamor for this evidence and who set it as a standard for research in this regard are the same people who benefit from the current and historical social structures and hierarchies this could suggest and indeed are often our participants often suggest that it does that they have much that they may not have as much of an investment in making material difference to the status quo it also adds yet another layer to the previous point about consultation fatigue because if the way the research is presented does not signify that it will be conducted in a safe and supportive environment people can be justifiably reluctant to contribute such an observation links back to the links to a final point relevant to the question of ethics in data collection which both returns to the significance placed on lived experiences and offers a somewhat contrasting perspective on people's reactions to being asked to share their stories because although the burden of representation is a prominent theme it is also often present alongside a certain amount of relief or even joy at being a certain amount of relief or even joy at being asked to at, at being asked to contribute and given the opportunity a sense of being considered or even valued furthermore this is additionally enhanced in the context of being arts projects that are directed at a specific demographic such as writers from the global majority or deaf and disabled and neurodivergent artists who then find themselves represented on our research team this underscores the transformational potential of having a more diverse and crucially representative academy and wider research sector as much as it emphasizes the importance of this within the creative and cultural industries i would include in this the concepts of co-creation and collaboration which perhaps suitably provocatively since this is a provocation i would in turn suggest that those who work in areas adjacent to the arts or or to be especially eager to embrace in this way data collection exercises may in them may in themselves come to mirror the kinds of change they and those of us who conduct them seek to encourage and advocate for a world where the multiple intersections of our experiences are not only taken into consideration but actively celebrated and supported thank you Thank you so much, Jessie. Hi, Ella.
Hi, um, thank you so much to all the speakers who've, who've spoken already. I've been really um, uh, provoked <laughs> and inspired by what's been said. I'm just going to um, share some slides in the chat um, for the purposes of access, um, but please obviously don't, um, yes, it's available for download, but please don't circulate. Um, uh, and I'm also going to share my screen. Um, I am um, a, a white woman um, in my early 30s with short brown hair. I'm a, a second generation migrant in the UK and though I work on questions of migration and in collaboration with migrants, I come to that um, from um, a position of no personal lived experience um, of long-term migration um, or um, direct impact of the hostile environment in the UK. Um, I uh, have occasional absence seizures due to epilepsy, so if it sounds like I'm trailing off or I've lost my train of thought, that might be um, why. Um, so I'm going to speak today about um, three projects um, that I've been working on in collaboration um, with migrant domestic workers and undocumented migrants in the UK. Um, I use, like Jesse, the term experts by experience advisedly, and I'll come back to that later um, in the kind of short talk. Um, um, but that's a kind of placeholder for now. Um, I'm going to speak about each of the um, kind of projects in turn, and then in the second kind of section, offer a few reflections that I hope will speak back to kind of some shared and resonant concerns around um, co-creative research and, and data collection. Um, and I think that Nayasha has kindly put a couple of links in the chat as well to the projects that I'm, I'm going to be speaking about. Um, so the first is a project um, that's available at homemakersounds.org. It's uh, a collection of sound walks which have been co-created with migrant domestic workers in the UK and in Lebanon. Um, the way the project works is that um, a collaborator would choose a location that's particularly meaningful or memorable for them. Um, and we would go for a walk there together and audio record a conversation. Um, and that conversation would then be co-edited with the collaborator learning um, to use sound editing software, of course, being remunerated for their time and their creative labor. Um, and kind of reworking that conversation into a shorter sound walk that can be downloaded and listened to either in the location it was recorded or following a creative prompt. Um, the co-editing process um, is obviously really key to kind of centralizing the decision-making um, role of the collaborator. Um, if you've ever done um, sound or film editing, you will know that it's an extremely slow and painstaking process. Um, and that affords a kind of, it makes space for some really kind of slow and considered decision-making um, about how collaborators want to um, present um, their, their perspectives and experiences and what they might not want to include. Um, they also make decisions around that based on their choice of location. So, for example, some collaborators have chosen um, sites of um, activists or community building importance, um, in which case they've chosen to kind of focus the conversation on that. Um, others have been sites of, for example, escapes from um, abusive employers where um, kind of more autobiographical narratives might come to the fore, but that's very much a choice that's made um, in that kind of initial selection of the place. And what I think that this, these kind of strategies um, enable is a shift from um, migrant domestic workers, um, kind of research conducted with migrant domestic workers being about harvesting evidence or their kind of perspectives and experience being used as evidence. Um, and authenticating those experiences to their dramaturgical decision-making and strategic decision-making um, about how those experiences might be listened to. Um, and that goes all the way from kind of um, choosing what parts of the initial conversation to include in the sound walk, all the way to kind of very technical decisions about volume, amplification, um, and kind of um, 
uh, the, the dramaturgical structure of the sound walk. Um, Hear Our Voices was um, a project that was effectively commissioned by Kanlungan Filipino Consortium, who I'd been working with on the sound walk project for a couple of years. Um, and was a response to um, the experiences of specifically um, precarious, irregular or undocumented Filipino migrants um, amidst the COVID pandemic. Um, so um, we initially conducted a, an online survey um, where about 80 um, people responded. Um, almost 90% of them were domestic and care workers. Um, so they were doing, um, you know, frontline um, interpersonal work, um, but many had been deterred from seeking care, from using test and trace, from um, accessing vaccines and so on, specifically due to um, data sharing with the Home Office, which has already been spoken about um, today. Um, based on um, that, those survey responses, we conducted 14 um, interviews, um, kind of follow-up interviews. Um, I was conducting interviews alongside a community advocate. Um, and we also, so on the basis of that, we produced two policy reports and also um, produced a zine, um, which was created from material produced by um, 14, um, a different group of 14, um, undocumented Filipino migrants who participated in three um, workshops, which I co-facilitated with the zine artist Kay Stevens of Daikon Collective um, and the playwright Rogelio Braga. Um, we made a kind of difficult decision to separate the publications. Um, so the zine Hear Our Voices came out at the same time as the second report, Essential and Invisible. Um, and we had a lot of conversations um, with my co-facilitators and with the group about um, how to present these two kind of um, modes of research, I suppose, or creation um, alongside one another. Um, it, what we, I'll talk about this a little bit further later on, but um, what we decided to do in the end in separating them was to try to avoid domesticating um, and reducing the language and kind of visual modes of expression of the zine into the language of academic um, research and kind of policy focused research. Um, Essential and Invisible um, is a kind of strategic policy focused publication um, and Hear Our Voices is more about building solidarity within and across communities um, and we were very conscious of the different kind of agendas and how they might be negotiated. Um, the final project that I'll um, outline is ongoing. Um, it's on outcomes for survivors of trafficking who return to the Philippines as their country of origin. So this research project is very targeted. Um, often the Home Office um, will uh, deport survivors of trafficking back to countries of origin um, on the justification that there's enough um, support for what's called reintegration in the country of origin, and therefore they don't need to stay in the UK to access that kind of support. Um, and the Home Office decision makers and then um, appeal judges will use what's called a, a body of country of origin information um, to make those kind of decisions and to, and to kind of evidence those decisions. Um, and we are hoping to contribute to that, that body of country of origin um, data um, in a way that um, uh, investigates whether um, there is that support available or it is a legitimate justification um, for deportation. Um, so this project is um, co-produced, co-created with members of the Voice of Domestic Workers, um, which is a domestic worker-led um, activist group. Um, and so I'm working with a team of five co-researchers who have um, who are themselves survivors of trafficking, um, originally from the Philippines, and who um, are kind of collaborating um, not only on doing the uh, kind of what we're calling creative interviews and um, with survivors who are now in the Philippines, but also, of course, in um, setting up the kind of research design from the very beginning of the project. Um, okay. 
So I'll move on now to a few kind of reflections um, that um, I've made over the course um, of doing these projects and through kind of what I've learned from, from co-creators. Um, the first is about policy as power and domestication. So I spoke about this a little bit earlier. Um, policy, I think, is obviously a really appealing focus for research um, because of the power that it, it seems to hold or that it promises um, in affecting structural change. Um, but speaking the language of policy um, and being obliged to do so in order to, to be heard by policymakers, um, I think is also can be a process of kind of domestication, um, which is a term that I borrowed from um, translation theory. Um, so it's a way of kind of translating experience and perspectives and expression um, into, uh, into another kind of um, register um, in a way that I think reduces and essentializes often um, that, that kind of diversity of expression and experience. Um, and so I've become kind of very conscious of the ways in which policy and academic language um, can be very reductive. Um, and uh, can kind of erase um, the kind of complexity and diversity of, of people's experiences. Um, the second, um, I think, has come up uh, several times already um, today, uh, especially in, in talks by Anik and Jesse, um, which is about thinking about experts by experience, so-called as strategic decision makers, rather than just providers of evidence or data. Um, so um, not all people who have lived experience of the issues being researched want to talk about those experiences. Um, they may want to have um, a, a strategic kind of decision making table that is informed by their experience, but doesn't necessarily kind of um, need, need to be. Um, need to be like voiced or need to be there in order to justify the decisions that they're making. Um, so I've chosen an image here of a domestic worker editing a sound walk, um, partly because um, of the ways in which in that project um, domestic workers chose um, how to kind of conceptualize their participation and how to um, shape the dramaturgies of what they were talking about in ways that went beyond um, simply kind of providing evidence um, in, in a um, in the kind of maybe more traditional um, ethnographic or research sense. Um, and finally, thinking about distributions of agency and labor, and this goes back also to what we said earlier about the researcher as a resource. Um, I think agency and labor um, are really kind of two sides of the same coin. And I think that often in collaborative and co-creative research, um, coordinators or facilitators um, kind of equate more agency with better research in ways that um, kind of ignore sometimes the kind of labor that that agency takes. Um, so how can we distribute um, those things in ways that are more um, equitable, in ways that facilitate or enable participation and decision making um, such that it, um, such that the kind of uh, labor um, Excuse me. Um, such that the um, the kind of less um, agential labour can be distributed elsewhere, essentially. So that basically, that the people who are making the decisions aren't also doing all the work. Um, so that they're remunerated for that work. Um, so that they're not invited, so called, into an existing space, or that they're not accessing an existing space um, without. Um, that space being changed and shaped and the distribution of labor in that space also kind of responding to their needs and wants. Um, okay, I'm gonna finish that. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hello, Dave. Hi, um, I'm Dave. Um, I'm an old, bald, white man uh, wearing a black shirt. Uh, and I'm in a sort of off-white um, living room, which um, if I had my way, I would have painted, but um, so that's that's not how it works, renting in London. Um, I'm slightly conscious of time, and, and maybe I'm just going to make three points. Um, I think there's been 
sort of much to agree with and, and much that uh, myself and various of my colleagues are, are sort of perennially frustrated with particularly how academic institutions uh, function and particularly how policy functions as well. At the same time, um, I think it's important to think through a really fundamental point about research, um, whether we're thinking about ethical practices for participation, whether we're thinking about ethical practices for data collection, whether we're thinking about ethical practices for research in general. And, and I think this is the question of why are we doing this? What is it for? What are the aims? What do we hope to achieve? And I think Annex point, um, you know, not to sort of paraphrase too much, was around, you know, data can be used as a way of really displacing change. And it can be used as a way for particularly organisations, some of whom behave incredibly uh, badly, as a way of saying, we can't do anything. We just don't know what the problem is. If you let us do some research or if somebody did some research for us, then we'd promise to act. And then, you know, when presented with, with things, they just kind of say, that's not quite the right research or things have moved on or, you know, that was out of date or, or whatever. And I think in, in that context, the temptation is always to say more research needed and virtually every academic will pay off with more research needed. And I think it's really difficult, both as academics, but, but also organisationally, to kind of say, maybe we don't need to do research. Maybe research is the wrong strategy here. Maybe a research project is not the right thing. And again, it's particularly difficult for me to kind of uh, suggest to others that maybe they shouldn't be doing research when it's not like I'm going to not do research projects. And, you know, it's not like I'll give up particular research agendas. But I do think if we stick with these kind of, you know, core questions about what's it for, who is the audience, why are we doing this, what, what kinds of outcomes do, do we want, we end up with, I think, quite different orientations towards research. It may be the case that, you know, research can be really important if there's a question about how do we establish um, if there is an issue or if there is a problem. Um, and one of the things that myself and, and some colleagues have, have tried to do with regard to things like arts audiences um, and broadly speaking, arts and creative industries workforces is with a whole range of other academic uh, researchers and, and also uh, campaigners as well, is to try and say these debates over, you know, are white men the last persecuted minority in the theatre or, you know, are old white men authors the real victims of whatever uh, cliched tabloid term it, it is preferred, you know, whether it's uh, political correctness or, you know, on to, to more recent terms, is to say actually there are ways of finding this out that use sets of data that um, the kinds of people making these spurious and incorrect cases tend to try and draw from and tend to agree with. So we've used a lot of Office for National Statistics data effectively, uh, which is um, comes with loads of problems, uh, lots of compromises. There are loads of things that uh, things like labor force surveys even things like the census get wrong and, and you know, sort of miss out and, and aren't very good at capturing. But they can be ways of saying, actually, the things that people are claiming are not true. And there are major problems that require organisational change and, you know, concrete interventions. And if I think about something like, um, say, um, social class and working in, in an artistic and cultural occupations. Um, one of the things that uh, people might have observed with, with the funding system in, in England, at least over the last sort of uh, three or four years or so, is um, a growing interest in the idea of socioeconomic or, or class diversity. And I think that interest is in, in some ways driven by um, not just academic work, but, but various bits of research that have said there is a real issue about social class in the arts and we can show you this issue using the kinds of data that the government who you know nominally is is kind of shaping arts council's agenda that the government accepts 
I think, though, what one of the issues um, is if we see the idea, and this is my second point of, well, we've you know used a data set that um, particular audiences agree has got high quality, and therefore the job is done. You know, we've proved this issue exists. What more do you want? Uh, and this, I, I think, is is a major problem for policy organisations who are very comfortable with the idea of we've done this research, we've shown there's a problem. Uh, what more do you want from us? You know, we've shown you that there's, there's a problem. And I think this is is where we have to be, you know, really kind of quite forceful and where a lot of campaigning energy needs to go is to say, actually, you know, research can um, only go so far and research has to be um, bound up with uh, actions and activities for change. Um, and I think there, there is a problem uh, with academics that, you know, in some ways our... Um, how would I think about it? the kind of regime that governs us encourages to do research, to write books, to write papers and kind of say, well, that's enough, you know, that we've taken this as far as we can. Um, and my third point, I guess, is, is, I guess, a question really is how do we think of projects, um, partnerships, coalitions, relationships that allow us to kind of bring together researchers, research expertise, um, often very, you know, kind of different with, with different orientations for projects that are about change. And to not see these things as it's a research project and in doing a research project, it will solve all of our questions, but rather to see, see these things as things that take time, that take a long time, um, that, you know, and, and not just, you know, we had a few meetings and therefore, or we published a paper and therefore, but have a much broader view um, of time and change. And crucially, how do we understand that they will only ever be partial interventions, you know, that they will gain traction for, you know, perhaps a year, two, three, and we will constantly need to be kind of rethinking um, what is effective, both in terms of what is effective of showing, bringing to light, you know, making transparent issues, but also at the same time showing, you know, what might work. And so I said I'd do three, but this is probably a fourth, a little kind of a, a addendum, uh, a little add on. One of the kind of crucial things, I think, is the way that we, we can ask questions about how do we share what we know? Um, because one of the things that struck me um, over the past sort of two years or so, um, working with both the all party parliamentary uh, group for creative diversity, but also working with um, the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee in, in the House of Commons and doing various other bits of policy, is that there's a real hunger for these, what works, what do we do? Um, policymakers are, are desperate to be told, tell us the one thing that we can change that would work. And the difficulty is always to, to say, I guess, here is you know a range of different strategies, techniques, a range of different practices. And, you know, we, we've heard a really rich set of examples of those different practices. But at the same time, there is no one solution to the social problems that ground many of the issues that we run into in arts and culture. And shifting that, I guess, assumption that there's one neat trick, whilst at the same time um, trying to work in ways that, you know, share effective practice, as my, my colleague Joanna Abey calls it, um, that shares, you know, insights, for example, again, about how research can be negative, how research can have, you know, quite um, disastrous consequences, how it might be better not to do research at all, I think is a really kind of serious question that almost goes unacknowledged or, or undiscussed in, in, in the rush to kind of assume that research can solve problems rather than actually research being one part of a broader strategy for change. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you very much to all the speakers and to all of you uh, for sitting with all of this in the lunchtime. I'm going to give us just a couple of minutes for anyone who wants to have ask any follow up questions or any clarifications or anything that you'd like to mention in the chat or otherwise. And um, whilst, um, whilst things are kind of still trickling in the room. So we might take 
a bit of a moment just to to notice if there's any questions for any of the speakers or any follow-ups that anyone would like to share in the chat. If whilst we're thinking, I'd also encourage you, if you haven't already, to flick through the chat. And thank you very much to everyone who's contributed in there as well. And there's there's a lot of intersections, ideas and provocations, I think, that are worth sitting with. I might, if it's OK with all of you and our speakers, slowly wrap up here to allow all of this to sit. Um, just a reminder of a couple of different things. Firstly, huge thanks to everybody who has spoken today for the work that you are doing and for sharing it with us today, and to all of you for coming. Uh, please do check out some of the events in the Freelance Futures program next week uh, on manifesting leader leadership, organizational activism, sustainability, governance. Um, there's lots of intersections, I think, with what's been shared here today. Um, I thought as well I would sort of leave us uh, with a quote I really love that I think resonates with what's been said today from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who talks about what the world will become already exists in fragments and pieces, experiments and possibilities. Uh, and on that note, thanks very much to all of you today. And uh, we are reconvening on the 5th of July. So if there's anything that you feel is important for us to think about and share, we will also pick up on it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.